I've got a bit of a confession to make. Up until this point, I've been framing this retrospective series as me effectively being an outsider. Someone who, until now, has just stayed in my happy little Paper Mario bubble, having slight interest in the sister series but never properly jumping in due to an overall lack of easy access to them, and that is true. I've also framed myself as someone who never really participated in any of the competition between the two franchises, and that's only partially true. Now, I never thought these two franchises nor their fans were at war or anything, like some console fans that treat their team versus the other. Sure, they were two branches of Mario occupying a similar space within the gaming landscape, but that doesn't necessarily mean there will or should be conflict. The fact that the Mario franchise could support two entirely different RPG series was a testament to how versatile and malleable Mario is, and the fact that these two series could coexist together was great for everyone. At least until it wasn't. As I'm sure most of you know, in the early 2010s, Nintendo decided to move the Paper Mario series away from its RPG roots, and instead started to focus on paper gimmicks for everything, a decision that I feel like the franchise has never recovered from. Now I've got a whole video on why Sticker Star in particular is awful, but aside from just being a bottom one game of all time for me, one of the worst things that Sticker Star did was poison how I felt about the Mario and Luigi franchise. After Sticker Star, and especially after Dream Team's release, I started to feel a bit of resentment towards Mario & Luigi. Like, why does Mario & Luigi deserve to be the one Mario RPG franchise? Paper Mario had been around longer, it had what I thought was the stronger legacy, and dang it, it's the franchise that I loved. Now, this never really became anger or anything, I just became a little bit dismissive of the series for a while. At least, until June 2015, where things came to a boiling point. Nintendo's E3 presentation in 2015 was one of the absolute best ever from an entertainment standpoint. The Iwata, Miyamoto, and Reggie Muppets and their antics were absolutely hilarious, and it really made the whole conference for me. On the other hand, most of their game announcements were, in my opinion, some of the least interesting, most nothing announcements ever. I mean, this was the year they announced such timeless classics as The Legend of Zelda Triforce Heroes, Animal Crossing Amiibo Festival, and Star Fox Zero. But there was one announcement that made a big impression on me. Xenoblade Chronicles X got announced, and let me tell you buddy, this game is amazing. I bought it on day one and didn't stop playing it until I 100%ed it over 225 hours later. I'm really surprised I haven't brought this to the Switch yet, I would buy it in a heartbeat. Oh, and Nintendo also announced Mario & Luigi Paper Jam, a new Mario & Luigi game, which now featured Paper Mario as a guest character, just to twist the knife, I suppose. I'm honestly not too proud of how I reacted to this, because it's just a video game, but when I saw it, I got angry. While I'm sure for a lot of Mario & Luigi fans at the time, they probably thought this was just a cool little crossover with that other series, but for me, and I'm sure plenty of other Paper Mario fans, this felt personal. It felt like Alpha Dream was purposely parade Paper Mario's corpse around just to cement how far it had fallen. That the series that had more influence on me than basically any other at that point was relegated to Captain Falcon in Smash Bros status, a pity cameo for fans of a dead franchise. While obviously the Paper Mario franchise didn't end with Sticker Star, this was before we knew anything about Color Splash, and considering how negatively Sticker Star was received by fans, the series' future was truly up in the air, and Paper Jam definitely didn't make me any more hopeful. And yeah, I kinda dumped all of these feelings onto Paper Jam and the Mario & Luigi franchise as a whole. That is, at least deep down, why I think I hadn't played any of these games since Dream Team up until now. And I know that wasn't, and is fair. But through these videos, I've given this series a chance, and I've honestly loved my time with them. Even the worst Mario & Luigi game is a fun time overall, and Paper Jam definitely deserves that same chance. So let's jump into the final original Mario & Luigi game, and see if they ended things on a high note, or if this crossover experiment ends up falling flat. Let's go. Now before we get started, if you like what I do, like the video and subscribe to the channel. If you really want to go above and beyond, you can join my Patreon, you'll get these videos a week in advance and you'll contribute to my current goal. If I hit 50 bucks a month, I'll drop everything else to cover Super Mario RPG. In the meantime, we'll be moving on to some other topics. Anyways, plug over.
So the game starts with Luigi plus generic Toad entering a dark room within Peach's castle, searching for the cause of a draft. This is already a bad sign, as this series had multiple unique Toad characters, and in a post-Sticker Star world, foregoing them for generic Toads is only a bad omen. Anyways, Luigi Luigi's things up, and in the chaos, a strange book is knocked down from one of the shelves. The book opens up on its own, and for some reason, starts spewing out characters from the Paper Mario universe. But what characters? The Paper Mario series series is chock full of awesome unique characters that could make for a fantastic cast in a Mario and Luigi game. Maybe Cooper or Goombello would come through and become new allies for the bros. Maybe Grotus has his sights set on an entirely new world to conquer. The possibilities are basically endless. We're not even done the intro and I already have to talk about this, don't I? Alright, so famously, Sticker Star and later Paper Mario games were mandated into restricting what was allowed to be presented in those games. The characters had to be for all intents and purposes stock standard Mario fare, and if they were going to include anything original, it had to be so unfitting and mesh so poorly with the setting that no one could see it as part of the Mario universe. I don't know if Alpha Dream was subject to this mandate as well, but considering how this game handles its characters and world, I feel like they must have been. Dream Team, for all of its faults, was incredibly creative. It gave us an entirely new land to explore, plenty of new characters to meet, introduced two new races, and even brought back characters from previous games in the series. It clearly respected its own legacy and realized that as a series, it had to build on its previous foundations and grow the world. Because of this willingness to grow and build, the Mario & Luigi universe was very unique within the Mario franchise, it had forged its own identity to make it stand out, and that is genuinely one of the things I love the most about it. But Paper Jam abandoned abandons all of that. Like, literally every single narrative and world building aspect that the Mario & Luigi series had made over the last 20 years is gone except for Starlow, and of all the things you keep, you keep Starlow? Come on. That literally means that Sticker Star has more unique characters than Paper Jam. Just let that sink in for a minute. The Bean People? Canned. The Brock People? Smashed. Unique, non-established Mario enemies? Deleted. Even Bowser's minions, Private Goomp, Corporal Paraplunk, and Sergeant Guy have been snapped into the ether. That is a particularly strange decision, one that makes me heavily lean towards the idea that Alpha Dream were forced to comply with the same restrictions poisoning Paper Mario for this game. See, early on, the bros meet this Paper Goomba, who they fight against and beat. He comes back a few times throughout the game, trying to get back into Bowser's good graces, and even joining up with the team for a while. Literally, the only thing about this Goomba that we're supposed to remember him by visually is the fact that he's slightly creased. This Goomba could have easily been a paper version of Private Goomp. The script literally would not have to change at all. You could just plop a paper Goomp sprite onto this Goomba, not even needing to mention him by name, and fans would recognize this as another cool way to tie these two worlds together. But instead, they took the Paper Mario route, attaching dialogue boxes to a generic sprite, and just hoping that we immediately recognize our new favorite character, this one Goomber. And the result of all this is a world that feels very similar to sticker stars. It feels small, insular, and dull. There are multiple towns, but their residents are mostly just some variant of generic toad, although there are some friendly nameless Lakitu around, but we'll get into them a bit later. And since there are no unique characters, that means there's no one to meet and no one to drive a story forward, so the aforementioned towns are no different from a save block you can buy items from. So, with their most creative scenario designers locked in a basement somewhere, Alpha Dream decided to basically cut their losses here and make as generic a Mario story as you could ever imagine. Okay, that's a bit of an exaggeration. According to a Miiverse interview the team did, the writers did come up with some cool story ideas, like the Mario Bros going back and forth between the two worlds, or the Mushroom Kingdom slowly turning into paper, stuff like that. But over time, as more and more drafts of the story came and went, they slowly whittled things down to what we've got here. While I don't doubt this at all, I also don't really think it it fully accounts for everything that's been lost here. There's no reason all the friendly NPCs had to be Toads, Paper, or otherwise, and the lack of staple Mario and Luigi cast members is truly jarring. So while there's nothing here that's a smoking gun proving 100% that Alpha Dream was limited in the same way that Paper Mario was, if they weren't, they accidentally wrote themselves into a similar corner which significantly affected the game's overall story. That being said, it's not like the game is completely devoid of any personality like 
next sticker star was. The Alpha Dream writers are still here and they're still firing on all cylinders, doing everything they can to make this situation a little more palatable. The game is still funny and there are a lot of fun little interactions between the two versions of each character, but we'll have to get into that a bit later on as well. Now, I've been comparing Paper Jam to Sticker Star a lot in this video so far, but I don't want to give the impression that this game is in any way on that game's level. It's just a necessary comparison because Sticker Star was the game that Alpha Dream referenced the most when making Paper Jam. I would say in terms of its narrative quality, it's a lot more in line with Color Splash, and while that is significantly higher praise, that still doesn't really mean it's any good. Anyways, back to the intro. The Mario and Luigi crew soon get introduced to the paper version of Princess Peach, and we pretty much immediately get our first goal. So instead of anything interesting, among those thrown out of the book were hundreds of toads, and we learn from a few of the paper toads in Peach's castle that the rest have all gone missing. So Mario has to go around the world and find them all. On top of that, Peach says that Paper Bowser and his minions are also here, and while they haven't done anything yet, Peach posits that when the two Bowsers meet, they'll probably be up to no good, and in in order to stand up to them, Mario and Luigi will have to find Paper Mario. So the bros set off to find Mario's paper counterpart, rescue some toads, and stop a Bowser or two. This is easily the weakest intro in the entire Mario RPG umbrella, and honestly one of the weaker Mario openings period, and I do include this. Even Sticker Star did a better job of creating a conflict that the player will want to solve. I mean, sure, all Sticker Star's intro had was Bowser touching a sticker and going crazy, but that is at least something. It's a setup that a better game may have been able to do something with. But outside of the novelty of the two different Mario spin-offs meeting, there's really nothing to care about, nothing to inspire a journey. So you kind of just have to push forward, hoping that there will eventually be something worth caring about, something that's interesting enough to justify spending time with with it. Thankfully though, and I feel kind of weird saying this considering this game is built off of Dream Team, but I think Paper Jam actually justifies itself pretty well, and that is entirely thanks to the gameplay. All things considered, I actually think Paper Jam is pretty fun to play. Starting off with the basic controls and movement, when you're exploring at the very start of the game, it plays pretty much identically to Dream Team's overworld movement. It's good, it's fine, but it's not very interesting on its own, especially since Dream Team already exists. But things expand pretty quickly and start to get a lot of fun. Soon after leaving the castle, the bros will meet Paper Mario and he'll join the crew, getting in line just behind Luigi, and this is where I start to have my first tinge of worry. This. This is weird. I understood having two characters paired together pretty easily. Even with some of its gameplay quirks, from Superstar Saga on, I was able to adapt to the bros jumping on different buttons, but it never 100% clicked with me here. Even on the 3DS, if I wanted to smoothly jump around with all three characters, I had to basically roll my thumb around the buttons, which is super unintuitive and pretty uncomfortable. Thankfully though, outside of this very first area where you meet Paper Mario, you won't have to do much of that, thanks to learning the game's absolute best edition, the dash. By holding X, the bros will all do a small jump, then once hitting the ground, run in place. When you let go of X, they'll all dash off together, moving around significantly faster than you ever could in this series, which on its own is great, but also, and arguably more importantly, by pressing X again while dashing, you'll get that same little jump, which is amazing for clearing gaps, since that's absolutely miserable if you try to do it with the regular jump buttons. This is my favorite added ability in the entire series. While I I honestly never thought getting around in the previous games was particularly sluggish, I'm not going to say no to a free speed boost, and because this ability is always mapped to the X button no matter what ability you've readied up, your team is always able to move around at breakneck speed, and always able to jump over almost any obstacle you come across, bypassing one of the oldest and most omnipresent issues with this series. I say almost because the dash jump isn't quite as high as a regular jump, they've gotta make you have to do a regular jump somehow, I guess. Speed Speaking of abilities, Paper Jam does something that no other game in the series has done to this point, aside from, I guess, Partners in Time, and does a complete overhaul of the abilities the bros can do. Since there's three mustachioed men in the party now, simple bros abilities like the spin jump aren't going to be feasible, so Alpha Dream has created a new set of abilities that use all three and take advantage of Paper Mario's papery attributes. The first one you unlock is the Trio Hammer ability, where the three bros all swing their hammers together into an object that's too big for one, one after 
after the other to break it. The second is the trio grab, which has the crew all jump on top of each other and can use Paper Mario to stretch out so the bros can grab far off gates, travel over gaps, or grab items. The third is the trio drill, which is the only ability that is largely based on something we've had before and is easily my favorite of the digging abilities. And lastly is the trio glider, which transforms Paper Mario into a papery glider, in what I hope is a reference to the Thousand Year Door, to let the bros reach higher areas and travel significantly longer distance than any other ability allows. I really like these for a few reasons. One is that they're so much simpler to use than Dream Team's abilities, specifically the Dream World abilities. They're all activated the exact same way by just pressing A, B, and Y in succession when Mario has that selected ability. This makes using them so much easier since there's only one command you need to remember. Imagine if each one had a different button combination to activate, like BUYA for grab or YAB for drill. That would be a nightmare and I'm so glad Alpha Dream went with the simpler, more convenient option here. Also, you can either cycle through these abilities with L and R or use the touchscreen to select the one you want. This is actually the only use of the touchscreen you'll find in Paper Jam and that's pretty great. Likewise, there's no motion controls either and I'm really glad that Alpha Dream has shied away from these hardware gimmicks and has attempted to let the game speak for itself. Second is that each of these abilities is fleshed out a ton and makes using them so much more fun since they're all given several different functions and are all used throughout the game for progression, platforming, and puzzles. Let's focus on the drill in particular here. In previous games, all you could really do with the drill was dig for beans and go underneath low walls to reach different areas. That was fine, but here it's completely overhauled and is so much more fun to use. When you're just moving around under the ground, you will automatically dig up beans whenever you come in contact with their spot. I have no idea why no one thought to do this in a previous game, but it is just so much more convenient here. Next, you get a drill dash that you can use while moving underground to break certain obstacles, move around quicker, and even dig up the side of walls with. Beyond that, the drill dash can be used to shoot out the sides of walls into floating platforms or rings to carry the bros even further. There's even more too, but you get the point. This is one ability that has so much functionality that all makes sense and all work together really well, but is simple enough to never be overwhelming. And the game's pretty good at teaching all of these abilities too, or more specifically, it knows when not to teach. One of the worst things about Dream Team was the tutorials. It destroyed the game's pacing pretty much from start to finish. It didn't respect your time or intelligence, and it always assumed that you were entirely incompetent, even approaching the final stretches of the experience. Paper Jam dials that back a lot, or at least it can. According to an interview with Game Informer, Alpha Dream created a system that was able to detect how the player was doing and if they needed tutorials. If so, they would activate, and if not, not, they'd just be put into the menu as an optional bit of information for future reference. I know this seems like a small thing, but the fact that the game is allowed to be a bit more hands-off really did a ton to bolster my enjoyment of the overall experience. The fact that the game gave me these tools then let me experiment with them, learn how they work at my own pace, and just let me play the game made a world of difference. It made exploring the game's world so much more fun than it would have been otherwise. And speaking of that world, in order to talk about a few of the other interesting things Paper Jam does, we're gonna need to go over how this game is structured and laid out. So in terms of its overall structure, I would actually compare it more closely to Bowser's Inside Story than anything else, at least its overworld exploration since there's no secondary 2D gameplay system here. In that game, you'd first explore each area with Bowser, missing out on a ton of the fringe collectibles and paths because you were Bowser and didn't have all the necessary abilities required to access them. His jump's not so good. But later on, once you freed the bros from Bowser's innards, you'd then be able to go through each area again with new abilities, new goals, and new ways to get around to get collectibles. Paper Jam does pretty much the same thing. There's only a few areas overall here, and they are, of course, standard Mario fare. Plains, Desert, Underground, Forest, Beach, Ice, and Bowser's Castle. But what makes them a bit more interesting than they normally would be is that you go through each area twice, reaching different parts of each area each time, using new abilities to do so, and tying these rather linear, disparate paths together in fun ways. See, the Kamiks from each world have gotten together and are using their magic to put papery blockades around each area to make it harder for the Mario Bros to reach the Bowsers. So, when you take your second trip through each area, the navigable paths will have completely changed, and you'll need to use new abilities you didn't have before to reach your next destinations. This particular bit of design makes up for something I was considering to be pretty annoying during my first playthrough. You may remember the one thing from the previous games aside from 
power low that Paper Jam has is beans, and beans work exactly the same way that they did in Dream Team, simple stat boosting items you can use on any of your team members. But you don't get the trio drill move until about halfway through the game, so as I was playing, getting further and further in with no way to get these beans, I was starting to dread having to backtrack through each area specifically to grab items that Dream Team let me get far, far earlier. But this ended up being pretty much fine, since as I was going through each of these places again regardless, I was never really forced to do much specific backtracking for beans. Now while this world design was pretty fitting for bean collecting, it wasn't quite as hospitable to attack pieces and they are entirely absent here. That is a shame, as Dream Team finally got them really right, but oh well. Their replacement isn't nearly as interesting, as at the start of the game, some toads are about to give you an entire arsenal of bros moves, only for Nabbit to show up out of nowhere and snatch all but two of them. As you go throughout the game, you'll find Nabbit, and if you chase after and catch him, he'll drop another bros move for you. Now these chases are pretty fun and make good use of the dash ability, but I can't help that feel like attack pieces are a much better system. This is an RPG the player should want to explore, and especially since the world design isn't nearly as interesting as Dream Team or Bowser's Inside Story, they really needed all the help they could get to get me or anyone to scour every bit of every area for goodies. Attack pieces did that, but without them, exploring is simply less interesting, especially since the main thing you will be gathering are coins and beans. Now, beans aren't the only collectible you'll be hunting for throughout the game though, because much like the Paper Mario games that came beyond this, one of the most important things you'll be doing in Paper Jam is collecting toads. When I first saw that this was a thing, my heart immediately sunk. Collecting toads was always one of my least favorite things in the modern Paper Mario games. Not that that says a lot since I have a lot of least favorite things in those games, but I feel like how Paper Jam did it is the least bad of them all. Yeah, there's still some pretty awful aspects about it, like you'll come across a specific enemy that you'll need to beat, but if you haven't collected enough toads, well then tough luck. You're literally just roadblocked until you go to the nearest Lakitu house and complete enough toad missions to progress. That's another thing some people may not be a big fan of. The toad collecting is mission based. Yeah, toads are not strewn about the world like how Color Splash and Origami King would end up doing. Whenever you need to collect toads, you head to a Lakitu house and select a mission where you'll be transported to a closed off area with a bunch of toads and you'll need to find them. Typically, these will be scavenger hunts of some kind where you'll need to go around this area and find toads that are hidden in various places. These get great use out of the dash since many toads will run away really quickly if you give chase to them. Others are a bit more unique, like having to gather toads in an area full of sand args, which will put you back to square one if any of them get grabbed. And there's even a few puzzle type ones where you'll need to use your hammer to free toads without splatting them. There are like 275 toads total that you can gather throughout the whole game. And while some of these mini games get you like 10, some will be upwards of 40. So despite you being forced to do them, they really aren't that time consuming. And if you take them for what they are, just fun little activities to break up the pace a bit, they are decently fun. I just wish they were more optional. At least they're a lot more fun than what they're needed for. So yeah, every time you need to gather toads, it's for one purpose and one purpose only, to create paper crafts. Toadette is actually in this game, and she is apparently a master of paper crafts. Whenever the bros come across one that Bowser's crew has made, she, along with the help of the paper toads you've saved up to that point, counter with one of her own, and this will trigger a paper craft battle. When you enter a paper craft battle, the Mario team will jump on top of whichever paper craft they're using, and the match will begin. The goal of each of these is to use your paper craft, which is carried by a bunch of toads, to destroy the opponents. Aside from driving around, for the most part, there's only two things you can really do. You can dash towards an enemy, doing chip damage and possibly knocking them over, or jump, which is your main attack, and does a ton of damage on a vulnerable opponent. That's basically it for most of them. Sure, there's some later paper crafts that have some slightly different abilities, but they very rarely matter, and it all comes down to dashing at the opponent at the right time to knock them down, then jumping on them afterwards. This isn't like a puzzle or anything that you have to solve either. The tells for every attack any enemy is going to do is incredibly easy to see, and even easier to avoid, and I often just spent my time sitting in front of the enemy waiting for it to do a thing so I can press the win button. Now there are some things you need to keep track of, your toads aren't exactly in great shape, so they'll run out of energy very quickly if you dash and jump around a lot, and you'll have to go to these places to recharge. I was thinking this would actually be a pretty cool mechanic. These recharge stations aren't hidden anywhere 
so I figured that it would be a risk reward sort of thing, where if you're running low, you'd have to take a chance at recharging, knowing that the enemy would attack you at any second. But nope, not really. While yeah, this does happen in the final papercraft fight, all of the others are much more considerate. If you decide to go recharge, the enemy will typically just sit there, looking at you like an idiot and not doing anything until you're done. That's pretty nice of them, but it doesn't really make for a fun mechanic, you know? What's also not super fun is the actual recharge mechanic. It's a basic rhythm game where you just have to press the button at the right timing over and over while infernal beings fill your screen. This rhythm never changes in any one battle, so if you wanted to just play a much less fun version of the Arm Center minigame from Bowser's Inside Story, well, first, what's wrong with you, and second, good news. And yeah, just overall, these aren't much fun. Some of the later ones get some unique gimmicks, and heck, I'd say the last one is actually pretty decent thanks to the fact that you actually have to work for your energy, but overall, these are one of the biggest fumbles to come out of the whole, hey, Paper Mario has paper in its name, let's only do that for everything trend that series had been struggling with since Sticker Star, and they're easily the least fun gimmick battles in the Mario and Luigi series. They're not engaging, they're not difficult, they're not creative, they're not strategic, and whenever I'm in one, I just want it to be over so I can go back to playing the regular part of the game, which is much more fun. And I think it's about time we start heading back towards the battle system. Man, it feels good to not say S at the end of that word. Yeah, there's only one battle system here, but thankfully, I feel like this is the most interesting take on the standard Mario and Luigi battle system that we've seen since Partners in Time. So at the start of the game, you just have Mario and Luigi, and the battle system feels pretty much identical to Dream Teams. Sure, there are a few things that are different, the animations when jumping on enemies is cooler, and the music is a remix of Superstar Saga's main battle theme, which was really nice to hear, but for all intents and purposes, if you've played Dream Team, you've played Paper Jam, at least for the first hour or so. Once Paper Mario joins up, things start to change though. Everything you expect from the bros is still here, jumping on enemies, whacking them with hammers, dodging or countering enemy attacks, even special bros moves that do more damage, though works. But Paper Mario here adds an entirely new layer to it. Now, attacks will start targeting all three, and it'll be a lot more difficult to dodge them, since Paper Mario stands a bit further back from the rest of the team. Paper Mario himself is a really unique character too. He gets a special option in battle that lets him Epson no Jutsu himself and create clones that he can use to both increase his damage and prevent him from taking HP damage. This is a really interesting interesting mechanic and means that if you manage him properly, Paper Mario not only becomes the strongest character, since each copy will add to his attack damage, but also the tankiest and least likely to get shredded. But on the other hand, if you don't and leave him on his own with no copies for any amount of time, he's the weakest and most likely to get pulped. He requires a lot more work to be effective and I can definitely see that as being a bit of a negative, but it's one that can be solved and we'll go over how in a little bit. On the defensive side of things, the team does account for Paper Mario being further back from the other bros by letting him sort of flutter in the air, giving a much longer jump than the other bros. More interestingly, if he has a lot of copies ready and an enemy goes for an attack that he can counter with hammers, he'll get multiple swings, making hammer countering much, much easier. Now, while Paper Mario is a Mario, he's not one of the Mario bros, if you know what I mean, so he can't participate in any of the regular bros moves, nor does he get any specific bros moves with either Mario or Luigi, but he does get his own set of commands, Trio Attacks. These are big cinematic attacks that require all three bros to use and are subsequently very powerful. I kinda liken them to the Luiginary attacks from Dream Team, except they're a bit more fun and a lot more balanced. It's not like in Dream Team where you'll want to use it every single turn, every single battle, they're big nukes that are well suited for larger battles and bosses. And Paper Jam actually brings something back to Trio and bros attacks that has been missing in Superstar Saga. You know how bros attacks had multiple versions in that game, a regular version, an easy mode that cost more, and a more powerful hard mode that was cheaper and stronger? Well, Paper Jam has that too, sort of. If you die in battle or choose it in the menu, you can enter easy mode. In this mode, you can actually choose between regular attacks or easy versions that slow things down but add an extra bros cost. This is super cool and something that I've missed in every game since that first one, but it's a 
cool feature that's locked behind easy mode. Why? Not only is this a good feature that increases player options, but it's a built-in learning tool that lets people learn by doing and move up to full speed when they feel comfortable. Why must the player be forced into babby mode where all difficulty and challenge evaporates to have this option? It boggles the mind that Alpha Dream would be building this game and say, Hey boss, uh, we've got this great game mechanic. It not only makes our battles more fun and interesting, but it's also a really great teaching tool as well. How do you think we should implement it? Just put it in the menu in easy mode. That's why you're the boss, boss. I'm going to lose my mind. Speaking of mind-boggling game design, I noticed something pretty strange when I was playing through the game, but we need a bit of setup here. The game's leveling system is pretty much identical to Dream Team, but with one major change. There's no bonus stats to place whenever you level up anymore, and I found that to be really odd. It's been a mainstay in the series from the very beginning. It was a great way to help players differentiate their play styles, and it was, for the most part, just a fun thing to do. But in Paper Jam, the stats you get are the stats you get, and they're set in stone every time. I can kind of see why the team would do this. Beans already exist, so you don't necessarily need another stat differentiator. And since by not having stats go up by a seemingly random amount every level due to player choice, the devs will know exactly how strong each character is at any one point, making the game balance a lot easier for them to do. But that's exactly the problem. The game's balance is absolutely wacky. In Xenoblade Chronicles, there's a mechanic where where if you're too far above or below an enemy in level, your stats will drastically change. If you're overleveled, your stats will effectively go through the roof, making fights even easier, and if you're underleveled, the opposite will happen, making fights that would be only slightly difficult based on pure numbers significantly harder. That doesn't exactly happen here, but the effect is very similar. If your party is within one or two levels of whatever enemy or boss you're fighting, chances are you'll be fine. Your attacks will do good damage, the enemies won't obliterate you and the game balance will be overall pretty good. But if you go above or below too much, the stat differential starts to get out of control and drastically affect what can happen. In my first playthrough, I was pretty underleveled because I'm always underleveled in RPGs, and some bosses were absolutely monstrous to overcome because I did no damage, I would get two shot by every enemy, and there was pretty much nothing I could do aside from grind. But in my second, I stayed pretty much in line with enemy levels, and that made a world of difference. Bosses that were really, really difficult in the first playthrough just evaporated in the second. This wasn't a massive level difference either, it's not like I was 10 levels below enemies in that first playthrough. My second playthrough was only like 3-ish levels higher at any one point. I don't know if this was a mistake, like they didn't test at lower levels or something, or if this was a conscious design decision, but if it was, it's a pretty weird one because more than anything else, this will just force people to grind or just hit their heads against boss walls until they finally break through. And this is Mario, not Sekiro, so this should never happen. One thing that can mitigate some of the difficulty issues are the rank up bonuses, which are very similar to Dream Team, but are a bit more interesting overall. On top of the general extra stats rank bonuses, which are always good, you can get some cool stuff like giving Paper Mario extra copies, which is a huge buff to him, or make copying himself not cost his action, as well as a few bonuses to a mechanic I'll go over in a bit. On the equipment side of things, it's pretty Pretty much what you'd expect if you play Dream Team, each bro gets a few specific gear slots for hammers and boots, as well as accessory slots that let them equip different stuff with more unique effects. Honestly, the only difference here is that Paper Mario's equipment is entirely separate from the regular bros' stuff, so it's a little bit more difficult to properly equip him than it is for Mario and Luigi. And there is one more option I should probably mention in battles here designed to make the game easier, the Emergency Guard. This is basically the equivalent of the standard guard in Paper Mario, except it feels like it was just cobbled into the system and wasn't properly built as a core mechanic. It's significantly easier to use, being basically an infinite block, but unlike the standard dodges and guards, this will only partially prevent damage rather than fully avoid it. I don't like it, honestly. I love the all or nothing approach this series has taken up to this point, and while I know it's just another option, I feel like in this particular case, it kind of undermines the core identity of the Mario and Luigi battle system. But thankfully, it is basically entirely optional, so aside from a few specific battles where you're pretty much forced to use it or take full damage, I typically chose to ignore this feature. So yeah, while I do think this combat is a bit better than Dream Team's, it's a little more inventive with enemy attacks, and Paper Mario himself is a really cool character with a lot of fun little mechanics tied to him, that's kind of just 
it a slightly better version of dream team's real world combat which was never really my favorite to begin with so that's pretty disappointing at least that's what was going through my mind in the first few hours of the game before the combat system had been fully formed yeah this game has xenoblade chronicles 2 syndrome there's one massive addition to the game's combat that drastically improves the overall experience which is locked about a quarter of the way through the battle cards i'm a pretty big sucker for deck building in any game give me a card and a deck to put it in and i'm probably already hooked. That was actually one of my biggest problems with Color Splash. They had this card battle system, but they refused to put any sort of deck building into it. Thankfully, Paper Jam actually kind of nails it and really elevates this game's battle system from something that was kind of okay into probably one of my favorites in the entire series. So like four hours into the game, the crew meets their totally unique Goomba friend in jail, and in exchange for busting him out, he gives them a set of battle cards. These basically take the place of badges from the previous these two games but goes even further with the idea. You could get a few different effects in Dream Team stored for use whenever you want, but you'd always have to take a few battles to recharge them and it wasn't always the most convenient if you wanted several effects ready at any one point. That issue is completely solved with battle cards. When you enter a battle you'll have three slots on the bottom screen. Every turn a new card will be dealt and you'll be able to either use it, hold it there for later, or turn it over letting a new card take its place. You can have a total of 10 cards at once and while that's not a lot I honestly wish you could increase the size of your deck somehow it's just enough to be able to build a deck with effects that you want while not feeling like you're going to be missing anything important for long periods of time and if you want to use more effects than one deck can supply you can build a second and save it for later unlike dream team though you can't just use them willy-nilly each card has a specific cost and if you don't have the proper amount of star points you won't be able to use them star points are built up over time you can easily get a few each battle even without using the star point boosting cards that you can have to increase that. What really makes this whole system for me is the variety of cards available. You can get cards with similar effects to previous games badges like doing damage to enemies, healing up, blocking hits for a few turns, that sort of thing, but they were able to go so much further with them now. You can get cards that'll lower specific enemy types levels by 5 making them much less dangerous, cards that'll max out Paper Mario's copies without costing a turn, even a card that'll defeat any enemy that's the same level as you which is really cool and reminds me a lot of the Final Fantasy 7 enemy skills level 5 death and stuff like that there's obviously far more that they could have done with this but for what it is a supplement to an existing battle system a set of effects that you can use to make your party stronger get more experience or be more resilient during bosses it really scratches that deck building itch and fully fleshes out this battle system into something great and this variety goes beyond even just the individual effects. When you start out, you basically get the worst versions of each card. That Goomba really should have invested in some nice card sleeves. The effects aren't the best and the cost is high, but as you play, you'll be able to get better versions which cost a bit more but are significantly more effective, and more importantly, you can even get special foil versions of cards which not only have that stronger effect, but at half that card's specific cost. These foil cards can only be found from enemies and can never be bought in stores, so if you're going to want to have a lot of them you're probably going to have to be either really lucky like I was or grind for them which is not great. Now the chances of getting these rarer cards is significantly increased when you fight shiny versions of enemies which are much stronger much rarer variants that are likely going to be upwards of 10 levels higher than you at any one point and that brings me to something I didn't really talk about in my previous video the expert challenges. Starting in Dream Team there were these things called expert challenges which are effectively just achievements. As you complete Complete more and more of them you get points that you can use to get equipment and stuff I didn't go over it in the dream team video because I didn't really care about the stuff you could get like ooh, you could get the birthday boots a piece of gear that's literally entirely useless 99.7% of the year thanks paper jam though it's a lot more useful because the stuff you can get is a lot more impactful especially for people who want to fully build out their decks with the best cards gear like the shiny ring may be really difficult to get to albeit not quite as hard as the equivalent Pokemon equipment but it's really useful as it'll greatly increase the amount of shiny enemies in battle making getting those rare foil cards so much easier on top of that you can also get gear that'll increase your stats based on the variety of cards you found and that can be huge 
challenge. The rewards here just do a much better job of making expert challenges worth seeking out and completing, which in turn makes the combat as a whole even more fun, as it incentivized me to experiment more, try new things, and get better at it. Honestly, the battle cards really do make the entire system for me. Once you get into the rhythm of constantly cycling for new cards to find the ones you need, constantly building star points to use those cards, it becomes so much more engaging, so much more rewarding, and so much more strategic. The cards really do add an entire new level of strategy and planning to every single battle. I don't think it's my favorite in the series, that still goes to Superstar Saga. Its battle system pretty much did everything it wanted to perfectly, and Paper Jam does still have some baffling design decisions and choices that hold it back. It's still way better than anything in Dream Team, however, I actually did have fun with these battles, at least once the battle cards started being a thing and completely changed the experience for the better. That's kind of Paper Jam's gameplay in a nutshell, slightly better than Dream Team did, with one or two small changes that really improved the experience, while also making some very odd choices that drag it down. On the presentation side of things, I honestly don't have a ton to say. It's Dream Team's art style with very, very little changed. There's a ton of reused assets and sprites, and while the new stuff they've added is good, it kind of just blurs together and I don't feel anything towards it. The Paper Mario stuff here isn't that much more interesting. Alpha Dream did work pretty closely with intelligence systems here, and specifically studied Sticker Star for their designs, maybe a bit too closely. Why does the Tower Power Pokemon have the sticker crown? Does this game take place in the middle of Sticker Star or something? Anyways, you may have noticed this, but this is the game that truly introduced the white border to the paper characters to make it obvious that they were made of paper because being flat, I guess, didn't sell the effect enough. I don't know if this was a 100% Alpha Dream decision though, as Color Splash released less than a year after this with the white border as well, and I highly doubt that the Color Splash team would see this game upon release, then rush to redo all of their game's assets to match that as Aesthetic. Chances are this was something that both teams were working on at the same time and coordinated this new style together. Now I've stated before that I don't really like the white outline, it kind of just looks bad all the time, and this game definitely hasn't changed my mind. The white outline looks bad and oh man I'm so glad that the Thousand Year Door remake doesn't use this aesthetic. And am I the only one that thinks the Paper Mario sprites don't mesh particularly well with the Dream Team art style? I honestly feel like this game with the Bowser's Inside Story style would look a lot better, since the more cartoony sprites along with their thick outlines would fit more with Paper Mario's overall design philosophy. That is admittedly small potatoes though, and the two styles aren't that jarring together. Beyond the sprites, the game looks fine. Obviously, with using generic Mario biomes for the levels, there's very little creativity expressed in any of them. It's a bit of a shock coming from Dream Team, which was overflowing with cool ideas and areas, to this, which is about as bland as can be. But it does look clean, and there's pretty much nothing to complain about on the technical side of things, so hooray. When it comes to sound, Yoko Shimomura once again reprises her role as the game's composer, and it's fine. Honestly, this is probably the most forgettable soundtrack in the series overall, but I kinda chalk that up to the less than interesting source material. It's really hard to write interesting music for really uninteresting settings, you know? But there definitely is some really good stuff here. Mountaintop Secrets is an amazing track. and I love it, and for how repetitive it is, I actually think the song that plays when you're finding toads is pretty great too. The battle tracks are also perfectly serviceable with the main battle track. being pretty fun, and the final battle theme being far more epic than that fight deserved, albeit not quite matching up to the previous game's finales. Yeah, so I think we're gonna start heading back towards the story now, and yeah, while there isn't gonna be a lot you haven't seen in other games here, there may still be something you may want to skip, so there's gonna be a timestamp here, 
Anyways, with that out of the way, let's go. So yeah, Peach's plan of sending the Mario Bros out to faff about in the Mushroom Kingdom while Bowsers are out planning things goes about as well as you'd expect. The Bowsers pretty much immediately raid the castle and kidnap the princesses. I for one am shocked. Doesn't Bowser know that kidnapping is illegal? Or maybe it's just illegal on paper. I'll see myself out. Honestly, the best thing about this whole situation is seeing the two Peaches interact and talk to each other while they're imprisoned. They're clearly the smartest people around and are just so done with this whole being kidnapped situation. It's nice to see Peach being able to talk to someone on her own level for once, even if it is just a big paper cutout of herself. Eventually, they get bored enough of being caged up while the Bowser Jr. slack off that they just leave. Paper Peach can obviously fit through the bars just fine, and from there, it's a pretty simple escape. Genius planning there, Bowser. Didn't he play thousands? your door. Now I focused on the two Peaches, but pretty much every character that teams up with their counterpart gets some fun interactions. The Kamiks are constantly squabbling about which one is smarter and better looking, the Bowser Juniors actually get along really well, and the two Bowsers are also constantly squabbling, but instead about which one should be Bowser Prime and the true leader. These are genuinely fun little interactions, but I can't help but feel like if the overall plot and story were more interesting, we'd be able to get a lot more out of this. Like imagine if Grotus did come through the book as well and start trying to do his thing. Even with the Marios roaming around, I can only imagine how peeved the Bowsers would get at this new guy trying to bite their style and how they'd try to plot to get one over on him while also dealing with the brothers and themselves. But alas, that's not what we got and while the writing does carry a lot, it can really only do so much with no backbone to support it. Anyways, with the revelation that the princesses have been captured, the bros rush off to save them. But for some reason, it seems like Bowser's crew always knows exactly where where they are and what they're doing, and that's because our friendly Lakitus are actually sending reports on our movements to the Bowsers. So while the bros are exploring the desert, they get ambushed and tossed in jail themselves. Paper Mario does remember the Thousand Year Door and very quickly breaks the other two out and off they go. But unfortunately, while Luigi was holding the book to the paper world, it was taken while they were captured and they have to get it back. While exploring the underground area they were locked in, they come across a big emblem on a door that is obviously the path to Bowser's castle so we need to keep track of that. Eventually, they find the medallion that goes in that door and are on their way to the castle. They reach it no problem and actually save both princesses with little trouble, but unfortunately both Bowsers are working together, have the book, and are now super mad, so they raise their castle into the sky and start readying up Neo Bowser Castle to take over the world. Mario and co can't let that happen, so they start to make the trek back up to the top of the mountain where they'll need to get to in order to get to Neo Bowser Castle. This involves some backtracking and a really cool section where you're playing as solo Luigi for a while in a spooky boo filled forest. This is actually the best Starlo moment in the game where she actually name drops the year of Luigi and points out some of his best qualities like being tall. I mean it's clearly not out of any real respect or admiration for Luigi. You can tell she doesn't believe a single word out of her mouth because she's Starlo and she's the worst but this is a fun little moment. Anyways once Luigi finds the rest of the team they continue to the top of the mountain where Toadette unveils her grand plan plan to get the bros up to Neo Bowser Castle. Toads. Yeah, Toadette reveals that all the toads you've saved throughout the adventure are going to be teaming up to create a path for you up to the castle. At least, I hope it's that easy. Both of my playthroughs had saved all of them at this point, so I don't actually know if there's another threshold that you have to meet beyond what you needed for the other paper crafts. But if you have saved all of them here, they'll give you a new bros move, which is great. And from here, it's really just raiding Neo Bowser Castle, getting to the top, and beating the Bowsers. We do get a really funny scene where each Bowser is planning on betraying the other, saying the exact same thing, but aside from that, it's just a dungeon filled with some minigames, some decent refights against the Koopalings. Oh, yeah, they're here. I forgot to mention them earlier. They don't really add anything to the story. They're just boss fights that pop up occasionally. But once we get through them, and of course, a final papercraft fight, which is mostly just a miniature boss rush against the previous ones, we get to have our final showdown with the Bowser duo. This is by far the weakest final boss in the series, and it's not even close. The first half of the fight is just so boring. The Bowsers don't have any interesting moves. They aren't difficult, it's just a nothing fight at least for the first half. It does get more interesting in the second half though. Paper Bowser gathers a ton of energy by absorbing a bunch of his paper minions and using that power transforms himself into a giant papercraft suit of armor for Bowser to wear. Now I know this is supposed to look intimidating and dangerous but I just can't get over how silly Bowser wearing a Bowser suit is. I just think of the Mario Party Bowser suit and imagine how goofy it would be if Bowser wore it. To be fair to the fight, once this second phase begins it is much better albeit not amazing. Bowser's 
moves are big, creative, flashy, and dangerous, and it does have a cool gimmick you need to deal with. In order to properly damage Bowser here, you need to first break the armor, since while he's wearing it, he's invincible. More sinisterly though, is that you can't use trio attacks until after breaking the armor as well, since if you try it before that, they'll just counter with their own version of a trio attack, which is more than a little threatening. Over time, the armor will repair itself, but it's not too difficult to break, especially if you're using proper battle cards and attacks. Eventually, once you do enough damage, they will go down. Regular Bowser gets the Paper Mario 64 treatment, and with Paper Bowser incapacitated and the book free, the bros use it to send him back to the paper world. With that, the day is basically saved. We cut to Princess Peach's castle, where the residents of both worlds celebrate. But even though the credits are rolling, the job's not actually done yet. We see the crew using their paper crafts and the book, traveling around the world, scooping up any of Bowser's paper remnants, which is a nice touch. And that was Mario & Luigi Paper Jam. This is a super weird one because while, yeah, this game is full of things I absolutely hated in certain other games, it barely does just enough to keep me invested enough to let the gameplay shine and carry the rest of the experience. The gameplay here is genuinely really fun most of the time, and the things that aren't as fun, like the papercraft battles, are thankfully few and far between. This is a game that's honestly carried hard by its overall much more fun movement and platforming thanks to the overhauled traversal abilities and dash, as well as the genius battle card system that elevates my second least favorite battle system up towards the top in the Mario & Luigi franchise. Beyond that, it's kind of just passable at best, and in the grand scheme of things, it's not a very memorable experience. If Alpha Dream were given the chance to make a game with the creativity of Dream Team, mixed with all the gameplay refinements and improvements of Paper Jam, I think we'd have a very big contender for an all-time great, honestly. The 3DS era of the Mario & Luigi franchise was pretty tumultuous, but for all the rough that there is, there is also a ton of diamonds. And even at its worst, Mario & Luigi is still pretty good. As someone who's traditionally been a Paper Mario fan, who's had to deal with a volatile quality level over the years to be kind, it's refreshing and impressive how steady the quality of this series has been overall. It's just a shame that we'll never get to see what they'd be able to come up with next, since as I said near the start of this video, this was the last original Mario & Luigi game, as Alpha Dream sadly filed for bankruptcy and closed their doors in 2020. That's a really sad loss, as their team was really talented and they were able to make some classic games in their time. I don't know exactly what caused their shutdown, whether it was bloating development costs or too much money spent on unsuccessful projects, but it's genuinely sad that they're gone, as the Mario & Luigi franchise was one of the best Mario series ever. I want to thank everyone who's joined me through this particular retrospective series. This was the first one that I've done basically from the start to finish blind. I've learned a lot and have come away from it a fan of Mario & Luigi. If Nintendo ever decides to one day bring this series back, you can bet that I'll be playing it and loving it just as much as anyone else would. Now, this series is technically over, but this isn't all the Mario & Luigi games. There are two remakes with a ton of new, unique content that they made after Paper Jam, and I have covered those as well. But it wasn't enough for a full video on this channel, so I decided to put my video on those remakes as an exclusive for my Patreon page. If you want to see what I thought about the remakes, as well as the included side stories, you know where to go. And with that, I think we're done with Mario for a while. I love Mario, which should be pretty obvious since I spent the last two years talking almost exclusively about his games, but I am more than ready to move on to something a little different. I hope to see you all there. Thank you so much for watching. And just before I end the video, I want to give a special thanks to my amazing patrons, R.A. Miller, Anon42, and Louis G. You're the best. Thank you so much.